Welcome back to Bio3D Prep. We're going to finish off the excretory system with this lecture by talking about some of the regulating factors of the excretory system. In your textbook it's pages 316 to 326. By the end of this lecture, you'll be able to describe how the kidney maintains homeostasis using negative feedback. We'll talk specifically about water balance and ion balance in the blood. Here we're also going to talk about the homeostatic process of maintaining blood pH, uh, which is actually done through an equilibrium reaction. You'll also be able to describe dialysis technologies. So, for water balance, water balance is extremely important. We need water at least every couple of days to prevent death. We lose about 2 liters of water every day from urination, perspiration, and expiration. Perspiration is, of course, sweating. Expiration is when every time we exhale, every time we breathe out, uh, there is water vapor in our breath. So we lose water when we exhale or when we expire. If we don't replace all of those two liters, uh, things happen. If we, if we only replace 1.96 liters, or basically, if we lose about 40 milliliters of fluid from our body, we start to feel thirsty. If we lose 100 milliliters, or if we only replace 1.9 liters of that 2 liters that we lose, we're going to start feeling pain and we could collapse, pass out. If we lose up to 200 milliliters of water from our body, if you think about it, 200 milliliters really isn't that much. That's less than one Coke can, uh, or less, less than one soda can of, of fluid, we can die. So replacing the water we lose is extremely important, or preventing water loss if we're not replacing it, is all is just as important. And of course, things like exercise and water intake are going to affect our urine output. Uh, water intake, uh, that's not just water from the tap uh, or from fluids. Everything we eat contains water. So every time we eat something, uh, we are able to take in some water as well. So it's not just the water you might drink from a cup. You don't have to drink uh, eight cups of water as just water. Some of the water we take in, for example, from fruits and vegetables are high in water. That's another source of water intake. Now, if we don't replace those two liters of water, then it's going to we're going to have to adjust our urine output, uh, and doing that involves both our nervous system, our endocrine system, interacting with the excretory system. So after eating a salty meal or neglecting to drink water regularly, uh, the osmotic pressure of our body or in our body fluids is going to increase. And the idea is if we eat something salty or if we don't drink enough water, then the ion concentration inside of our blood is going to be high. Let's see if I can find a spot to write this down here. So we have high ion concentration in blood. The rest of our body tissues have a relatively low ion concentration in the rest of our body cells. And so what this does, this forces water to flow from an area of low concentration to an area of high concentration. So water is going to start flowing from our cells into our circulatory system, which isn't a great thing because we want to keep that water in the cells that are going to be using it for their reactions. So this is, this is osmotic pressure or the force of water being drawn into our circulatory system. This is going to stimulate a series of events which, uh, for one thing, the first thing we're going to notice is urine becomes scant or decreased in volume and it's going to become concentrated, usually more yellow in color, as that water is reabsorbed from the urine uh, back into our circulatory system in order to stop this or in order to reduce the concentration of ions in our blood. There's a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone, the name's in the next slide. Uh, it's going to increase the permeability of the distal tubule and the collecting ducts to water, allowing osmosis to occur and allowing water to stay inside of our body. This response is going to return the osmotic pressure back to normal, and it's also going to uh, cause us to feel thirsty increasing our water intake, both of which are going to decrease the ion concentration in our blood. So, ADH antidiuretic hormone, it helps regulate osmotic pressure on the kidneys by the body uh, to increase water reabsorption. 
It's going to increase the concentration of toxins in our urine, so our urine is going to become more concentrated. It's produced by the hypothalamus and stored in the pituitary, both of which are located in the brain, or are part of the brain. The hypothalamus is this little triangular region here, and then you can see this little nugget kind of hanging down. That's the pituitary. So those two regions are where ADH is going to come from. When ADH is required, it gets released from the pituitary, dumped into our circulatory system, and from there, it's going to reach every part of our body, but the only part it's going to affect is the kidneys. So it's transported to the kidneys via the circulatory system, and it's going to make those distal tubules and collecting duct more permeable to water. So here's how it works. There are osmoreceptors located in the hypothalamus. So in our brain, there's these things called osmoreceptors. They detect the pressure of osmosis. As the solute concentration inside of our blood vessels increases, or as our blood gets more salty, the osmosis, osmosis causes water to move from hypothalamus cells into our bloodstream. This causes the hypothalamus cells to shrink. The shrinking stimulates those cells uh, to signal the pituitary, and the pituitary releases ADH, or antidiuretic hormone, into the circulatory system. It travels to the kidney, through the bloodstream, causing the nephron to reabsorb more water. This is going to produce urine with a higher concentration of waste. The shrinking of those hypothalamic cells is also going to stimulate our thirst response, so we're going to want to drink some water because that will help decrease osmotic pressure. As the solute concentration in our blood decreases, so do the secretion of ADH. So as the solute concentration in our blood, as that concentration decreases, so does the secretion of ADH. So here's a, a, homeos or a uh, negative feedback loop. The first factor would be dehydration. Uh, we're not replacing water that's leaving our body. So the stimulus is an increase of osmotic pressure on the body fluids. High ion concentration in the blood sucking that water out of the rest of our body cells. The sensor would be the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. The control center is the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland it should be written in here. Huh. There we go. Releases antidiuretic hormone. That is going to cause the distal tubules and collecting ducts to become more permeable to water. And so the response is an increased water reabsorption due to increased permeability. A reduction in urine, more water is going to stay in the blood. This is our negative feedback. As more water stays in the blood, it's going to decrease osmotic pressure because the ion concentration decreases. That's going to be sensed by our hypothalamus, and the whole thing will shut down once osmotic pressure returns back to normal. So ADH and the nephron Normally, about 85% of the water entering the nephron is reabsorbed back into the blood. Because the proximal tubule is highly permeable to water, the descending loop of Hennel is permeable to water and ions. That other 15% will be reabsorbed if the pituitary gland secretes ADH. It's going to increase the permeability of the collecting duct, making water flow back into the circulatory system. The high concentration of sodium chloride ions outside the nephron, and remember, when we have our nephron, we have to remember that it crosses both tissues of our kidney. There's the cortex. Here's the medulla. The medulla is salty. So as if when ADH affects this distal tubule, it's going to increase water reabsorption into that salty medullary tissue. And from there, it can get back into our circulatory system. Now, we also maintain salts in much the same way, or our salt concentrations. It's going to be a different hormone from a different place, but same sort of process. So the kidney regulates sodium and other ion concentrations. It also regulates blood pressure. These concentrations can also be affected by diet and activity level. So uh, a high salt diet, obviously, is going to increase salt concentrations in our blood. Aldosterone is the hormone that increases sodium ion reabsorption in the distal tubule. So if sodium ion concentration is decreasing in our body, uh, 
Aldosterone is the hormone that's going to cause more sodium to be reabsorbed into our blood. The negative ions and water are going to follow that sodium just like we didn't be described in the last lecture. In the last lecture we said sodium is actively transported from the nephron into the circulatory system. This is increasing the amount of active transport. Following that sodium are going to be the negative ions and water is also going to be reabsorbed. It also helps maintain blood pressure. The kidney can affect blood pressure by affecting blood volume. If we increase our blood volume or if we increase the amount of fluid inside of our blood, pre blood vessels, that's going to increase blood, blood pressure. If we decrease the amount of fluid in our blood vessels, that's going to decrease blood pressure. So that's what that says there. It's monitored by pressure receptors in the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Juxta means beside. Glomerular is a glomerulus. So beside the glomerulus is a, are the pressure receptors. We're just going to say the kidney does it. This apparatus releases renin when blood pressure is low. So if blood pressure is low, renin is released into the circulatory system. It activates a plasma protein. If we take a look, we have a angiotensinogen, like pepsinogen or chemotrypsinogen. That synogen is the inactive protein. It gets activated in the presence of renin, and it's called angiotensin II. The angiotensin has two functions. First, it's going to stimulate the constriction of blood vessels, so it makes all the blood vessels smaller. If blood vessels shrink in size, that's going to increase blood pressure because we're decreasing the amount of space that that blood gets. The second thing it's going to do is it's going to stimulate the secretion of aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. And the adrenal gland, if we just draw a kidney here, ooh, that's not a very good kidney, but it'll do. There's our kidney. On top of the kidney is a little walnut-shaped gland called the adrenal gland. And just like the kidney, it has two parts. It has a, a cortex on the outside, a medulla on the inside, and each part uh, secretes different hormones. So this would be a adrenal gland. And the adrenal cortex is a part that secretes aldosterone. That aldosterone increases the sodium reabsorption, which is then going to increase water reabsorption back into the bloodstream, which is then going to increase our blood pressure because more fluid is entering our body. Again, another homeostatic loop. We have a decrease in blood volume or a decrease in ion concentration. Either way, that's going to cause a decrease in blood pressure. If we have a decrease in ion concentration, then water isn't going to be reabsorbed back into the circulatory system. If there's less water in our circulatory system, blood pressure is going to drop. The sensor is the kidney, that juxtaglomerular apparatus. We're just going to go with the kidney. It secretes renin. Renin reacts to form angiotensin II and that's going to cause our adrenal gland to secrete aldosterone from the adrenal cortex. The effectors are the nephron and the response is water and sodium ion reabsorption. So sodium ions, this is by active transport. Following that is going to be water by osmosis. Negative feedback, as more fluid enters the circulatory system, blood volume increases, therefore blood pressure increases. That's sensed by our kidney, it stops secreting renin, and the negative feedback loop shuts down. Our kidneys also maintain pH. Our blood pH is maintained at about 7.4. If it changes much more than 0.3 or 0.4, pH units, uh, it can cause acidosis, which is a bad thing, or uh, acidosis, or our blood be can become too alkaline, and that's a bad thing as well. Now it turns out naturally that our blood is going, our blood tends to decrease pH naturally. Cellular respiration, every single one of our cells is producing CO2 as we metabolize sugar, we produce CO2, and that CO2 creates carbonic acid decreasing the pH of our blood. The acid levels can be decreased, which is going to be an increase in pH, 
by reducing our breathing rate. If we breathe more slowly, it reduces cellular respiration. Um, also, we have what's called a blood buffering system. So in our blood, this reaction is happening, and it goes in both directions depending on what concentration is higher. As we increase the amount of CO2 in our blood, the reaction is pushed this way to make carbonic acid, which then breaks apart to form hydrogen ions, and that's what makes our blood acidic. If we increase the concentration of something on this side of our reaction, either the acid ions or the bicarbonate ions, then the reaction goes in the other direction. An increase in hydrogen ions can cause the reaction to shift to the right, reducing acid levels. A decrease in hydrogen ions can cause the reaction to shift to the left, increasing acid levels. So depending on what's being added or subtracted to our blood, the reaction is going to shift one way or the other. In the kidneys, the kidneys have the ability to secrete, so, so tubular secretion of hydrogen ions and the reabsorption of bicarbonate ions to reduce acidity in the blood. So if we take a look at this reaction, these things can leave by secretion. We're also going to take on more bicarbonate ions. As we absorb more bicarbonate ions, our blood pH rises, and that's generally enough to maintain the pH of our blood. Because, because our blood becomes more acidic naturally, because cellular respiration continues to produce carbon dioxide, which push this reaction off to the left. Um, if it turns out that the blood starts becoming too basic, this secretion simply stops until our blood returns to uh, the appropriate pH level. Now dialysis is our attempt to replicate the function of the kidney. When kidney failure occurs, blood plasma becomes uremic because the urea molecules accumulate to dangerous levels. Imbalances of other substances occur. Our sodium ion uh, concentrations are going to be out of whack because we, those aren't being maintained. Uh, blood pressure can vary widely if we don't have a mechanism to control it at the kidney. So dialysis is a medical procedure in which the composition of the plasma is corrected through diffusion. So we have a dialyzing fluid or distillate which, separate, which is separate from the patient's blood by a thin semi-permeable membrane and then molecules and ions diffuse into or out of the patient's plasma depending upon the composition of the distillate. Generally we're, di generally we're taking things out of the blood. We want to take that waste out of the circulatory system and so the distillate has to be carefully formulated in order to correct the composition of uremic plasma. There's two types of uh, dialysis. The first is hemodialysis, and this is where they hook up a tube to our circulatory system at an artery and vein, and they're joined together by a fistula to make it easier to get access to the blood. And the blood is basically diverted out of the body. So here we have the blood leaving the body. It goes into a container that is put beside dialyzing fluid and they're separated by an artificial membrane or a semi-permeable membrane. The waste material is going to diffuse across the membrane. So here we have distillate fluid coming up into this container. Notice that it's clean when it comes in. So by diffusion, waste material diffuses across the membrane into the dialyzing fluid and then out into a waste container. So uh, this is hemodialysis. Uh, hemodialysis treatment takes about three to five hours to complete. So it's a slow process. It's done three or four times per week. And during this process, the person must remain seated or lying down during the procedure. So hemodialysis, the benefit is you only have to do it three or four times per week. It's still a lot, but compared to the other type of dialysis, it's not all that often. The downside is you actually have to go somewhere to have it done, and you're hooked up to a great big machine. And this is the part that always boggles my mind. Here we have a great big machine replacing to fist-sized organs in our body. So it takes tons and tons of machinery and technology just to replace two fist-sized organs inside of our body. The other type of dialysis is peritoneal dialysis. 
and this is where the intestinal lining is used as our semipermeable membrane. So the dialyzing fluid is dumped into our peritoneum, into our abdominal cavity, and there waste is diffused from our abdominal cavity into the peritoneal uh, dialysis, and then after the fluid is removed or drained back out and it contains the waste. Now the benefit is that it surgically, the, after the surgery, um, the distal is always present and the blood is continually being filtered. So there's none of this going in three to five times a week to get it done because you simply kind of do it yourself. Um, it can be done anywhere at home, work or school. And so it's more convenient. Uh, however, it does take three to five exchanges of fresh fluid each time a day. So it requires uh, constant monitoring on a daily basis because it doesn't take as much waste out per use. Um, in an automated peritoneal dialysis, there's a machine that performs the exchange which is done at night uh, for about 12 hours. So you lie down, you hook up the machine and then it's going to exchange the fluid for you. So it's a little bit more convenient but it requires surgery in the abdomen and all kinds of other nasty stuff. Neither peritoneal dialysis or hemodialysis are as efficient as our kidneys. So in summary, uh, you should have the idea that ADH is the pituitary hormone that increases water reabsorption in the collecting ducts and the distal tubule in response to dehydration, so loss of water. Aldosterone is an adrenal hormone that increases blood volume and blood pressure by increasing sodium reabsorption. The water is going to be reabsorbed by osmosis. The kidney can also regulate blood pH by secreting excess hydrogen ions or protons. And kidney failure can be temporarily treated by dialysis, but dialysis is not a permanent solution. Kidney transplant is the only way to really replace a failed kidney. That's the end of our uh, excretory system. In the next lecture, we'll be starting on the muscular system. Only two lectures left, and then we're done the course.